Hello and welcome to this session of the Sibling Leadership Network Conference, Supporting Families to Navigate the IDD System. My name is Tiffany Banks and I will be your moderator for this session. If your camera is on, we can see you. And if your microphone is on, we can hear you. Please mute yourself. Use the chat box or the raise hand function for any questions that you may have. The presenter will respond to questions at the end of the session. Um, as a reminder, this session is being recorded and will be made available to SLN members in our online archive. I will be placing a uh, link in the chat box for the handout. Um, and now I will turn the session over to our presenter. All right, I got a little carried away with that mute button. Um, <laughs> well, one, I want to say thank you so much, uh, Sibling Leadership Network, for having me. Um, this is an honor. Uh, I feel so privileged that I've been able to um, partner uh, in various uh, conversations, uh, roundtable conversations, and just uh, groups. Uh, as a sibling myself, I really feel the need uh, to have spaces where uh, I can talk about my experience and also hear from others and learn from others as well. So I really appreciate you. Thank you so very much. Uh, so today we are gonna discuss um, navigating systems uh, for families that are seeking support in the, in the IDD community or the IDD um, system. So uh, individuals with intellectual, physical disabilities, uh, there are various systems that uh, are needed to uh, support um, families and that individual with the barriers. And I work right in the middle of that. So uh, I, my role at the Arc of King County where I work uh, is an outreach and advocacy coordinator. I, spe I specifically, or I have an emphasis, I should say, uh, on African-American families uh, with loved ones with intellectual physical disabilities. And uh, I really enjoy the work. I really enjoy helping families navigate um, systems, but also just their life and setting up um, um, supports for their, their loved ones. Uh, and so that sometimes that's creating a group, uh, a support group. And then in other cases, I've created uh, advocacy groups where for instance, I, uh, I have a, a nice group of um, uh, parents uh, that um, wanted to come together and learn about what it means to, what a bill is. So this is kind of legislative stuff. What a bill is, how does a bill get passed into law and how that affects our community and our families. And so I'm currently walking a, a, a group of individuals through that and um, we have some great curriculum that's going to come out of that, great supports for the greater community, and um, it's just a good time. It's a good time. Um, so today, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about who I am and my background, because as a sibling, I didn't even understand how much experience I was getting by way of uh, witnessing my parents advocate for my brother, Stephen. Um, uh, who uh, had cerebral palsy among other disabilities. And, um, you know, it's hindsight's 2020. When you go into a field and you look back, you're just like, oh, wow, I can use all of that, all of that pain, all of that frustration, joy, um, triumph to help other families. So I'm going to give you a little backstory on me and then we're going to move forward. I'm going to give you some tips and some advice. Um, and then we're going to have a great conversation in, during the Q&A. So originally, I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, right off of Park Avenue, 34th and Park Avenue. Um, this is blocks away from where we experienced tragedy earlier uh, in 2020. I have lots of family there, uncles, aunties, grandmas, cousins. Um, and so uh, in the school systems, uh, early on, we, we knew a lot of people. I have th three brothers, uh, 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 Paris, Nate, Stephen. Stephen was the one with significant barriers. And um, we just felt strong. We felt like this is, this is home. Then in 1986, our parents decided to move us to 
um, Washington. And not Seattle, Washington, kind of cool Washington. No, we moved to Des Moines, Washington. So we went from sidewalks, we went from having sidewalks to like gravel roads. And there used to be buses like on every block. Oh, you just go down, take the bus down, you know, four blocks, hop off, take a bus down, you know, left or right on a grid. Des Moines was like, walk two miles, there's a bus stop down there. <laughs> you get on that bus, you take the bus to where you're going, get off, walk another mile, and then you're there. So it was just like, what is this? Um, and, you know, so there was that. And then uh, we were in a predominantly African-American BPOC community in, in Minneapolis. And so then Des Moines, Washington was really underdeveloped um, and kind of small town feel in mostly Caucasian uh, white. And that was kind of culture shock for us in our community, but also in the school systems and the different things, different systems we were going to for support. So it was just, you know, little random things like even food. Like I know that zucchini is a, a vegetable and you're supposed to chop that up and roast it and, and eat it with dinner. But when I got out here, people were putting zucchini in the bread. They were making zucchini bread. And I, 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 and I, and you know, it was like, I don't know about, you know, I don't know what this is about. And I'm not saying that that's a culturally like connected. I don't know who invented zucchini bread, but we had never seen anything like that. So it was just kind of a shock, you know, just all those things. We kind of felt like fish out of water. And so, you know, just kind of give you the backdrop. And so, uh, our parents, um, you know, they 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 really uh, leaned in to um, systems and trying to reach people that could help my brother and even help us uh, in the school systems. But I uh, early on had challenges in uh, my education, so that was a uh, you know I got a snapshot of of, of what it looked like to be. Uh, in, in the special ed system. And honestly, when we left Minnesota, I wasn't in any special classes. When we got out here, the system wanted to put me in special classes for every subject. So I witnessed a mother that was like, no, we, this is not, I know my son, I know where we're from. Here are some things, here's some information you need. We need to work through this. And I I was in the middle of that. I watched that, I, I experienced that. Um, and you know, at times it was very, very hard. Um, so what I'll say is, no matter where you're at, if you've moved or you're, you're, you've been where you live uh, for some time, um, hardship around not having community can be a barrier. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's right out front, um, it's in your face. You do feel isolated, uh, you do feel uh, confined, but I would, if, if you have your notepad out, here's where you can start taking notes. I would encourage you to, and this is not deep, but I, I've seen a wealth of good fruit come from this. Um, really try to lean into um, building a community, community. And that doesn't always mean building like family or building or going and finding a best friend, um, but you want to uh, let the, the, the support system, the, the place that you're trying to navigate, you want to let them know who you are. And, um, and I know it, it might sound like, oh, the, you know, I'm just a squeaky wheel, but we do know that the squeaky wheels do get the most oil. Uh, and it's, it's, you don't have to be confrontational. Uh, you don't have to be upset or irritated, although those are feelings that we do feel. Um, but just assert yourself, introduce yourself, um, take emails. So uh, it, hypothetical, I can give you. So if you're um, reaching out to a system like the ARC, the ARC of King County, we, we're, we're, it's kind of an easy one because we're looking for families that that want resources and information. But even in that, um, I would encourage you to get to know who's on the team, who's who, who's good at what, uh, and uh, take down individual emails, individual numbers, uh, and put that in your Rolodex, your phone book, 
and save it on whatever drive you have um, because that's gonna be a bridge uh, that you're building and soon you're gonna have to try to cross that bridge to get information um, um, that you need. And I can say that a lot of the families that I support in a special ed system, whether you know they're trying to navigate the IEP parent or the IEP um, process and meetings and, and, and what that legal document's about or um, SSI, which I'm not a pro in SSI, but it's a crazy system. Um, a lot of families call is, is information, lack of information. And so if you can connect to people that can give you information that is going to be beneficial uh, for you in the moment. And then also it gives you something to research. And here's the cool thing. It gives you more questions to ask, right? So we don't have to know everything, but some information can give you the, uh, enough to ask the right question and then you get the right breakthrough. Um, also, I would say that um, uh, another barrier and another uh, thing that you could be looking at um, is uh, trying to find um, emotional support. You don't have to go through this all alone. I know that sometimes it feels like, you know, you're the Lone Ranger. I work with a lot of single moms who, uh, you know, they've done most of everything on their own. And so they just are stuck in the mode of like, I'm here, I'm doing this you know, I can take it. I honestly recommend, um, you know, if you can connect with someone, an advocate, uh, uh, or get in a support group um, of some kind where there are other individuals that share the same experience as you uh, or are looking for the same type of information as you are. So they might not, they're, they're in that group, they might not have all the answers, but there are people there that are searching for, for the same answers you are, that can be very helpful because it helps you regulate your emotions and your energy. And, you know, this is whenever, so if you have, if you learn that your child's diagnosed, if your child's diagnosed with, with IDD, uh, you know, from birth or, uh, or early on, it's, you have a long way to go in, in the school system and, and in some of these government systems. And so, um, grouping in with people that, that share your experience. And I'm not even saying, you know, ethnic background or skin color. I'm saying share your experience could be very, very helpful uh, in, in you regulating your emotions and having someone to vent to about, hey, this is just hard. And I, I, I've had to create groups within the Arca King County for that specifically um, where families can come and just share and just talk and just decompress in all the craziness from all the craziness. So if you can, if you, if you, if there are diff different groups that you see that are gathering, I urge you to just take a leap of faith and see uh, exactly what those are. And here's the thing, if you, if, you know, if you just, if you feel inclined, you can even start a group yourself, uh, 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 that parent group, um, a neighborhood group, uh, just uh, wherever you're at, a place where people can come talk and, and be themselves. Um, let me take a sip. Um, okay. So also, I would say that um, when talking to, uh, when getting in, 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 you know, into systems and getting, talking to organizations, um, school system, uh, I mainly work in the school, it, with the school systems and, and I actually uh, have a long history of um, employment support. So there are a lot of like families that are trying to navigate, you know, okay, my son is, out of school and he wants to get a job and you know what what agencies uh, uh, can better support my kids and 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 all of and you know all of their needs and all of those things um i would say that um you should remember 
as you're connecting with these different agencies uh, and you're getting your name out there and you're taking you know, advice or, or information um, to also remember um, that you also are an expert on your loved one. A lot of times when we try to um, uh, get resources or we're going into a new system, it can be very um, discouraging and we can feel as though we don't know much, but I really want to uh, express to you that you know a lot more than you may um, realize. One, because the individual that you're supporting is someone that you are relationally connected to, someone that you uh, have witnessed uh, it, uh, develop and grow and have success and have challenges. And I just want to, to, to really, really bring that point home that um, you're an expert. You're an expert. That doesn't mean that you know everything. That doesn't mean that, that you're a pro and you have all the automated responses when they ask questions, but you do know a lot uh, and you do have a wealth of experience with the individual that you're finding support for. So um, keep that with you when you're you know, meeting uh, someone for the first time that may have information that you need or um, you're going into that meeting uh, to represent your loved one and, and, and maybe uh, assess a situation or assess a type of support that they need, please, please, please understand that your experience makes you an expert and that you do know um, uh, quite a bit that will add value and that is already adding value to the person you're getting support for. And also you're adding value because you're coming to that professional um, with great questions uh, that pertain, to, and those answers pertain to the individual you're advocating for moving forward. So please remember that. Um, I would also say that um, systems can get very political. Whenever, you know, they can get it, it's, you know, you start to hear about, hear things like it's not, a, it's not about um, you know, what you know, it's about who you know, and you know, it, you know this, that, and the other. Um, I would say in some cases that's true, but when you're navigating systems in the IDD, in uh, finding supports for your loved one with IDD, um, I'm always gonna go with policies over politics. Policies over pol politics, right? I, I, you know, I'm not gonna get into the politics of it, but I wanna know the policies. I wanna know the framework. How are you helping people in the community? What is, what are you, if I, if you say you want to join with me and support with me, what am I signing up for? What is the policy behind that? Getting a clear understanding. So really remember that policies over politics. Um, uh, and it's not, you know, you want to be professional and kind. And if you work together to support your loved one in whatever system you're in, that you're going to build some positive you know, rapport, and that's all great. But at the heart of it, make sure that they're providing you with policies. And, and that though you can, so if there's someone who, let's just say, is doesn't seem too interested in helping you, if you're asking for policies and they're denying you of that information, you can ride that up, the, you can ride that up the food chain. You can just say, hey, you know what, this has really been great, but who else can I speak to who may have a little more authority or, you know, bandwidth to, to support me? Um, and when you talk to them, it's about policies, it's about framework. And you take that back, you research that, you come up with really good questions, and then you go back prepared and uh, you pursue um, uh, the next step. So please, please um, remember that and keep that in mind. Uh, I would also say that um, it's very easy to get in the race of things, the, the, the rush of things like, okay, I'm 
in, I, you know, I met the special ed teacher or I met the principal, I know the gen ed teachers, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm moving, things are, things are moving along great. Uh, I have my notepad and, and, and my, you know, my contacts, everything's awesome. I'm not getting all the information, but I feel like I'm making progress. I would also encourage you when you, you're, you're analyzing these systems and building these, uh, these um, relationships uh, to self-assess, take time out of it, step out of it and self-assess. Okay, and what, what comes with self-assessing is, is basically saying, okay, where did I start? What, what, what have I gotten that has been useful? What have I gotten that hasn't been useful? Who are the people that seem like they're really trying to help me? They're really trying to support me, right? Um, I, I, love, I love this. Uh, I don't know if it's a proverb. I don't know if someone just came up with it, but I've heard it and I just always stuck. But it's a, 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 the saying goes, go or you're celebrated, not tolerated. So you're going to want, when you're self-assessing and you're looking at all the people that you've met, I would prioritize the people that you feel are celebrating you, right? Celebrating you. So they're for you. They're, you know, they, they, they are really actually genuinely interested in getting you what you need uh, and helping you through the systems. Because you don't go through any systems by yourself. You need people. You need professionals. It, it's just, that's just how it's set up. But if you can identify those that celebrate you and that don't, that aren't tolerating you, because you can feel it when someone's tolerating you. You can feel it when someone's just like, they're, they're, you're telling them everything, but it's like a, it's a stone wall, you know, and it, it, it's just not getting through. There's, they're not, there isn't great interest in helping you move forward. And, you, and if you put a lot of energy into those individuals, you can waste a lot of energy. But if you find just one or two people that uh, are celebrating you and that want to actually see you grow and win, um, in that self-assessed time, put a star by their name and, and, and stay in the front of their, their inbox. I would say email. This is just a, another little tip. When you're talking to people and you're building relationships and people are trying to help you and some maybe not so much, email is a beautiful thing because when you self-assess, you can go through your email conversations and you can analyze what are you getting from uh, the individuals or that's those systems. It seems like a simple thing, but I all, even if I'm in person, it doesn't matter what, you know, you know, where, what, um, classroom or, or, or what org, uh, I, I'm always following up with an email saying, hey, it was so nice to build with you today. It was so great that we were able to talk about this. I look forward to speaking to you soon. And then you capture that. Now, on another level, if you're looking, if you're trying to work with teachers at school or you're trying to get some type of a, a, a DDA approval, uh, for waivers, or uh, you're trying to get more information about what does that even entail, um, email, phone calls are great, but always follow up with emails because you can catalog, categorize them. And when you follow up, you can reference them. Uh, and so that's just really great when you step out to self-assess, having those emails, having that information, um, and, and you're literally building a platform uh, to grow on and to move forward with. It seems like a lot of work, but honestly, uh, it's it's all worth its weight in gold because uh, one thing that I consistently, and I love being a support in the role that I'm in, but one thing that I consistently uh, am seeing is, is a lot of parents who um, they're very detail oriented in their situation, but it's not documented anywhere. And and it, that that means that um, you know it, 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 you're every single person that you talk to, um, you know you're going to have to go through this whole spill. Whereas, as you can, you know, if you have it somewhere documented, some type of Word doc or whatever with the emails, however you want to do it, you can help move further, faster, clearer, um, 
you can take emotion out of it in some cases and just say, hey, look, this has been in my experience. Can you help me? And that, um, in some cases, um, is really efficient because the person that might be able to open that door, they might not have a lot of time or bandwidth, but because you were organized and you had everything together, you were able uh, uh, to move forward um, because inside of the system, it's just people. You're dealing with people that have access to information, to resources, to everything that you need. There's always a person, I call them a gatekeeper at each place. And so it's really good to, to be organized and to have everything uh, in place so you can get further faster. Okay. Also, I would like to say, and I, I think, and please moderator, let me know, how are we on time? I, I think we have 45 minutes. So I know I, yeah, okay, so great. We're doing great. Um, I would also want to kind of conclude in, uh, and, and I'd love to hear just some thoughts um, and have you ask some questions, but I would, I want to conclude in is, is the thing I want to say is, is don't let fear stand in the way of you getting the support that you need. It can be a very, few, it can be a very frightening place to be in. Uh, uh, be, you know, it's like that, you know, when we were in grade school, it, it's like that first day of school kind of feeling like no one knows me here. Uh, you know, I don't know the lay of the land, like where's my seat? You know, when is, when is lunchtime? <laughs> like all of those things, it's that feeling when you go into a maybe, and maybe not right now, but you go into an office lobby or you reach out to someone to set up a Zoom uh, uh, meeting, um, go for it. Really go for it. Uh, you, you, you are, um, you, if you're gonna fall, fall forward, right? Fall forward. Don't fall back, but fall forward. And that means not letting that fear stop you from, from getting the relationship or the information that you need. And, um, and I, I really want you to know that it's, it's, it, there's a, right now we're just kind of in a world where, you know, isolation is kind of the, you know, it's kind of this weird norm that we have. Uh, and I would say resist that as much as you can. Um, and, and it is a lot, I feel it is a lot easier to overcome that when you know you're doing it for someone else. You're doing it for your loved one. You're an advocate, you're a leader, you're walking someone uh, through something uh, so that they could have better. And then also you could have better because if your, your loved ones are doing good, you're doing good. And um, so I, I, I'd like you to, to, to really um, consider that, consider that. Um, and now I'm open for Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Richard, uh, for hearing all of your um, amazing feedback for everyone. We have a few questions in the chat box. Yep. I'm going to start um, up at the top. So uh, Katie asks, uh, what is your perspective on siblings being a part of the IEP process? How can siblings be included in a way that makes sense, is not too overwhelming, and supports the person with a disability and their SID? Yeah, so that's a great question. I would say that um, you have the individual. I, I always recommend that the individual uh, that you're going as the as the I would say as the the parent advocate or the guardian advocate. Um, I would say have the individual involved in that conversation as much as possible. So the IEP meeting is one thing, even outside of the IEP meeting, I always encourage to have those conversations. What do you want as an individual? How do you feel? Are these accommodations that they're creating for you, are they working? Right, that's, that's, a, you know, that's going to help you discern what you have to do in the IEP meeting, and 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 you're not just speaking off of assumption, right? You're speaking out of relationship and conversation, and having the individual in the meeting with you only adds value. Uh, 
yes, if there's a mo if there's a, a spot for them to speak, um, and it's you know it's appropriate. And sometimes IEP meetings can be crazy. Um, a lot of them are. Uh, then I would encourage for the individual to say something. It adds self worth, self value, and let's remember this whole meeting is about <laughs> about them. So it's like have words. Um, and then also, I would say that, um, yeah, I would say, yeah, that's not, that I think I would, I would, I would keep it there. I'll keep it there. Hopefully that's helpful. Thanks, Richard. Our next question comes from Allison, and she asks, how do you deal with service providers who sometimes devalue family perspectives or think that families are unreasonable or like they don't actually know anything? It's a great question, Allison. Um, well, see, there's a number of ways you can handle that. <laughs> um, but I would say it, it, it honestly, when I, when I spoke about going where you're celebra celebrated and not tolerated, I would, I would push back. I always encourage families to push back. If you're discerning that, you know what, you're devaluing me, you're condescending, you're not trying to understand who I am uh, uh, as a person, uh, my background, my makeup, uh, then push back, let that be known. And then, uh, you know, self-advocate, say, I would like to talk to someone else about receiving supports. You're not the only person that can help me, right? You're not the only person that can do this for me. And um, I, and then, and then if they're, if they say, okay, fine, I have someone else, then you, I would definitely file a report, file a complaint, express yourself. Um, and if they're kind of in the scenario still, and there's someone else is pulled into it, because sometimes it gets messy like that, call a meeting, call a meeting and air it out, um, air it out. And, and stand, you know, flat footed and just speak, hey, this is this, this is my experience. And this is this is these are things that need to stop because we need to move forward as a family and tr And I, I think having a friend outside of these meetings where you can just go scream at the top of your lungs and just and just yell, you hate the world also helps. Then you go back into those meetings with your composure and you self advocate and advocate for your loved one. So I would I would definitely uh, go that route. Unfortunately, there are so many service orgs who are not inclusive that say that they get it, that say that they know what's going on in our communities, but they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. Well put. Uh, Kyla wrote a question. Uh, from your experience, for the families that you support, how do you find enough people to A, create a support group catered towards them, and B, sustain that group? For example, are there facilitators within the group? Okay, repeat the question. I just wanna make sure I get, there's the A, B. Let me, I wanna make sure, one more time. Yeah, from your experience, for the families that you support, how do you find enough people to create the support group catered towards them and to sustain that group? Okay. Um, well, sometimes it can be tricky. I think that um, your best bet is to, first of all, go after the low hanging fruit. So if you're in a region that has like, you know, an arc of King County, we have groups like Open Doors, we have groups, you know, there are a lot of different um, agencies that provide information. Um, you want to put yourself in situations where you can meet people that have like experiences. So a lot of times organizations like that service orgs and they'll have movie nights, they'll have game nights, they'll have trainings and, and uh, things of that nature. Uh, go to those and, and don't be afraid to introduce yourself and, and let people know who you are. Um, I know that that's really hard, uh, but if you're going to have a group that works, you want to make sure the people that are in that group get it. Uh, and so once you find that one, maybe two people that are in your group, um, find common goals, find common goals. I think common goals are, is, is what keeps a group together. So if, if 
you find, if you build a group and you guys all agree that the IEP process is, is just a wreck and, and, you know, a lot needs to change, that's going to tie you together. And you guys are going to be able to literally put your heads together and help your families in that process. So that's how I would, that's how you could find the right people and then also sustain that group. So our next question is also from Kyla, um, and she is giving some context here that uh, her family was warned um, that high school would be much harder than grade school and kind of giving the context to that uh, this individual is from Canada, so things could be different there. But the question I think is uh, pretty universal about how do you find the gatekeepers? How do you figure out who the gatekeepers are? Okay, in pertaining to the school systems. Okay. Yeah. Okay, school systems. Okay, so number one, um, you're always gonna want you're always going to build want to build up from the immediate teachers that that the individual that's in the class has. So building that relationship, that I'm talking first day of school, uh, introducing yourself, giving your email address getting their email address, talking to them about the school, the classroom. Uh, and in that conversation, you know, you can ask about the lay of the land and who does what and where are they and, and, you know, who has authority in what areas from their perspective. Now, a lot of times it's the teacher, the principal, uh, it, you know, those are two, you know, players. But if you have special ed and gen ed, you know, you want to get to know all of them. Uh, and I think most of the families that I work with, um, once they've built some type of relationship with uh, the teachers and the principal, uh, you have you have enough information there to know, okay, who's who's making moves and who's really not. I think being in the atmosphere of the school, so being in the mix, uh, is going to give you greater context as well. But Though that I always recommend those key relationships and don't be afraid to go introduce yourself to the principal when there isn't an issue, it helps. Actually, it looks like she's gonna ask a question. Awesome, awesome, this is great. Yeah, sorry, thank you so much, Tiffany. Uh, just to give context, because um, we've kind of, we've kind of gone through that relationship trial of okay. you know, fostering those relationships. Yeah. We, um, kept within policy we've had some really great mentors and we've even gone higher up to superintendents okay so there's a but, scenario okay yeah so I'm just curious as to like kind of going from there like how do you find the gatekeepers if you even feel like it's not I don't, I'm not gonna use the word battle because we want to work with the team right but you just feel like you're running in circles okay well I think in okay so if we're gonna look at who the gatekeeper is you have to consider what it what it is that you want. Like, what do you actually want? Um, that identifies who, that helps you identify who is the gatekeeper for what you need. Um, and sometimes it's not the super, sometimes it's not the person with the most authority, like the superintendent runs the whole scenario. Um, but I think that self-assessing, kind of stepping back and looking at everything that you've been through, and where all the you know barricades are, um, and then identifying okay who can help me get through the door that I need to get through. So without you know you giving your personal you know scenario, um, you can pinpoint that gatekeeper once you've identified okay you have what we need. Um, at that point, it's all about finding a way to put pressure on that on that individual pressure and that's why i say it, you know it's it can get very political right you, you it's just a whole political game but you want to go back to policies you want to use the system to uh to help you uh, by way of okay well it's i i'm actually entitled to this actually so let's have a conversation i mean it's I, you'd be amazed how many how many parents I support that don't know that the IEP is a legal document. You know, like it's binding, like it's this is a law, this is a law situation. 
And so, yeah, it's cute that we're having this IEP meeting, but um, <laughs> I'm the parent and here are some accommodations that we're going to need, you know, and not letting up because you get the run around. Oh, we can't this and all. Our, yeah. Oh, oh, we're going to find a way, you know, and 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 and. It really, I mean, you don't want to have to go like the 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 lawyer route and all that. Like that's that's unfortunate when when it gets to that point. But I think understanding what you need and what your what the policies say, what your rights are, and then applying pressure to the individual who can give it, but not by you know you're not waiting for them out in the parking lot after after the meeting. Nothing crazy, but you're but you're literally like. <laughs> You're literally taking to them and saying, hey, this is <laughs> this is actually what's ours already. We need you to, to, to go ahead and provide that for us. Hopefully that helps. And that's the last of our questions that were written in. And so okay. you know, we still have a little bit of time. Uh, certainly if you guys want to ask a question verbally uh feel free to raise your hand if you want to type it in the box again we have yeah that very very first question was there something in there about the actual sibling giving support um it was about how, how to involve the sibling in the iep process like what makes okay. the most sense okay um, so let me just touch on that as well okay because i i focused on the individual and the support person but as the sibling I would say that the sibling uh, is very important uh, by way of having an understanding through relationship on what the individual could need and how they could respond to different environments and different things that um, teachers come up with like um, solutions, right? This would be great. The sibling is another voice to say, no, actually that's not gonna be great. Actually, that this is how that's gonna play out. I think, Overall, on the back side of things, um, having a home team, and this is why I train on, on who should be in your IEP support team uh, and who those people are, right? Uh, but I would say uh, when you're creating that team, uh, having a sibling there, hopefully the relationships are in a place where the individual receiving the support has agreed to put them on the team, right? So there's buy-in from everyone and you collaborate outside of the IEP meetings, and then you go into those meetings together um, and, and, and really go for getting the support needed. So I, I, siblings are, 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 can, can, in some cases, a lot of cases, really be a game changer because it's another loved one that can advocate and, and help the person get what they need. I think there's a hand, I think, Kayla. Kayla's got her hands up. Go ahead, Kayla. Yeah, I actually just wanted to kind of share my take, Richard, because I've been in part of the IEP process for my own sister, and I can affirm and confirm that the sibling perspective is so important, and I'm not sure where everyone's kind of at in their stage of life, but um, having that conversation with your parents, because I know with my sister, I've, I've, my suggestions have been heavily, have heavily influenced her IEP, just because I know her from a different perspective from my parents. And I've been part of the meetings, the school meetings, advocating for inclusion for, for school. And um, it was kind of great because I do find the teachers, um, they're so used to seeing parents, right? So seeing someone who's closer to the school age, kind yeah. of, uh, uh, you know, closer to school age, they, they do kind of, I find in my case, take it a little bit seriously. I mean, in the situation we are now, not so great, but in grade school, and it was super awesome. <laughs> so you do really value that. <laughs> so I just want to kind of affirm the sibling perspective on that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Allison, Allison. I believe. Yes, I think we have time for one more, Allison. So go oh, ahead. It's 43. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'll try to keep it quick. So uh, I, I love what you said about go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. And I just love that so much. Um, and as a family member, like that's what I want for my sister. Mm -hmm. And then if I am thinking about my professional role in, in trying to support disability rights and support 
programs and practices that support people yeah. of, uh, you know, any background. Yeah. I struggle with that a little bit because I want to kind of eliminate those places that are just tolerating people yeah. and, uh, and really um, promote everyone to be celebrated. Um, so I, I love that idea. And that's, that's like, when I think about my personal life, that's absolutely what I advocate for. And what I talk to my parents about, like, you know, F this place that's not accepting my sister, like, let's just not go there anymore. Like, let's go to this place that is more accepting. And then when I put kind of my professional hat on, I'm like, how do we help all places be accepting and loving and all of that? So I, I don't know, that's, <laughs> I don't know that that's a question, but like, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, so I, I just want to say that, you know, I really appreciate all your words and everything that you're saying and the heart that you're putting behind those words. I really just think that uh, it really takes people, you know, um, using their voice to say, hey, you know, in my dealings with you and working with you, like, I don't know if I feel like you're receiving of, of what we need and not in a like a, you know, outside with picket signs type of scenario, but you know, if you're here to support individuals with disabilities, like we want to see that we want to, you know, we want to see that and we want to feel that. And maybe you don't know what that means. So maybe it's a teachable moment. Maybe let me tell you about inclusion, what an inclusion looks like and how it can best benefit, you know, because all places aren't inclusive. inclusive. You go into restaurants and there may be someone that is in a wheelchair and there's no ramp, you know, there's no, there's just, you know, there are things that just aren't thought about, like, and, and so I would say as a solution oriented comment is, is like, be willing to have those conversations and just say, hey, I want to see what you really know. And, and, and if you, and if you say, you know, these things, then come on, be about it. But if you don't know these things, all right, let's get you up to speed. So that's, that's kind of my two cents on that. Snaps to that. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. We are out of time, but thank you all so much for coming to today's session. Next, we have mindfulness techniques to enhance well being. I've already put the Zoom link in the box there for you so you don't have to go back into your email for it. And we will see you over there. <laughs>